located right on top of the Continental Divide in Colorado. We're here for the final stop on the World Pro Mogul Tour. And once again, our expert commentator is the former World Mogul Champion, Peter Johnson. And Peter, this is a very tight competition. This could decide who wins the Saab Turbo. Well, but it's been a long, exciting year. And uh, Joey Cordeau has 150 Grand Prix points going into this last event. David Godstein is close behind with 115. Now, with 50 points at stake, uh, Godstein could, sh could catch up and make an upset for the uh, Grand Prix standings and the Saab Turbo. It's going to be very exciting. Now, this is a very, very steep course. With their styles, whom do you think it favors? Boy, it all depends. Godstein is very familiar. Uh, coming from the Washington area, he, ski he skis very steep uh, runs. Cordeaux has the same familiarity with this type of uh, terrain. It's hard to say. They're two different types of skiers. Uh, Cordeaux skis with his skis together. Um, David Godstein skis more like a racer with a racer technique, so it's going to be up to the judges. Well, who knows? We just talked about these two. We have a whale of a field besides David Godstein and Joey Cordeaux, so somebody else could upset these two. And That's we'll right. find out when the competition begins in just a moment. It's a gorgeous warm day here, as you can see by this group enjoying themselves. And the first race features Joey Cordeaux, who's a leader on the tour, but he fell at Aspen Highlands the last competition against Chris Chavez in the striped shirt. And Joey Cordeaux, our outstanding favorite this afternoon, with a nice uh, daffy by Chris Chavez. It looks like Joey Cordeaux is out in the lead in the, sec in the uh, middle section of the course, turning very well. Both skiers are skiing very well uh, here for the first run of the day. Some good turns being performed by Joey Cordeaux. I think both skiers, bud, will be... Uh -oh. oh! It looks like Chavez is down. And that advances Joey Cordeaux on to the second round. A tough break for Chris Chavez, who was a 1979 New Zealand overall champion and pro bowler at the same time, which is an interesting mixture. And you can see that Joey Cordeaux is really feeling the altitude he did there over 12,000 feet. He has five races to go. The physical conditioning might really affect this as we see Joey Cordeau and a great spread eagle. Beautiful spread eagle, bud. And you're, you are right. Uh, endurance is very important at this altitude, uh, especially in the first, first few runs of the day. Skiers have got to uh, get their lung capacity and their strength together until they really start turning on later on in the afternoon. Well, I would think you'd try and go as easily as you can as we're watching Joy Cordeaux with some more air because, as you said, you have five races if you reach the finals. And at this mm -hmm. altitude, that is very, very tough. Beautiful performance here by Joey Cordeaux. He looks so smooth, so liquid, so easy at all times, totally effortless. Earlier this week, I talked with Joey Cordeaux about the Aspen Highlands competition held earlier this season. Joey, you had a bad run at Aspen. What occurred? Um, it wasn't generally a bad run. It was just I was going real fast, and I went into a big compression, and when I came up over the mogul, I shot my ski out. It just counterflexed off. That's rather technical. You give it to a leg, and you compress <laughs> and counterflex. Now, will you tell me what you mean? Okay, when you go into the hole of the mogul, what happens is your skis will bend, okay? Will bend to the unnatural camera. Right. And then you come back up to where it goes to back to the way the ski was designed to be, you know, to have, to have camber. And when that happened, the heel piece never came back quick enough so that I popped up at the toe. Disappointing what for you, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, very. What a gorgeous day here at Arapahoe Basin. Nice and warm. We're waiting for the start of the second pair. That is Gary Westman, number nine. He'll be on the blue course on the left-hand side. He'll be facing Charlie Webster, number 83. It's a very warm day. How does that affect the moguls, Peter? Well, the moguls, bud, will certainly soften up with uh, the sun out, and I think the skiers will enjoy that a little better because uh, they'll be more forgiving than if you were skiing on a hard-packed mogul run. That's Charlie Webster in the red sweater on the left-hand course, and there they go, Charlie Webster against Gary Westman. It looks like Charlie Webster had a little bit of difficulty at the start there, but it looks like he's uh, caught up here with Gary Westman. That is Gary Westman out ahead with the hat on. Charles Webster is not skiing very well. It looks like the moguls are throwing him more than they should be, bud. Now he's doing a lot better. This is coming down into the steep section of the course. A lot of competitors prefer the steeper section that allows them to let their skis run. And Charlie Webster crosses the line first. That doesn't necessarily mean he wins. It only counts 20% of the mark, but he is the winner. Charlie Webster over Gary Westman. Gary Westman with the hat on, so Charlie Webster will advance to the next round. And there are five judges. And earlier I talked uh, with the Aspen Highlands winner, a very fine
and skier naturally Stu O'Brien. Stu, congratulations on winning at Aspen. Was that Thank a surprise to you or not? Uh, I'd, I'd like to say it was no surprise at all, but I think it's, it's a little surprise to all of us when we win. I, only one person can win every week, of course, and we're all hot and we're all here doing it. And uh, I'm, I'm glad uh, I could do well this week. Well, the racers are getting ready at the top of this extremely steep course. In the red will be Bill Keenan. He's wearing yellow, number 48. And on the right-hand side on the blue course will be Stu O'Brien. Now, Stu O'Brien is the favorite here, but Bill Keenan from Calgary, Canada, was a 1980, up, 1980, that is, World Cup Rookie of the Year. He's a very hot skier, so it should be extremely close. Since uh, Stu O'Brien, as we mentioned, won, there he is at number five at Aspen Highlands. He is the favorite, but be careful of Bill Keenan on the left. They're getting ready at the top, trying to relax on this gorgeous day. You can see that beautiful Colorado sky. That is Stu O'Brien once again. Again, will be closest to you. The red sweater is the easiest way to determine it against in yellow is Bill Keenan. This is going to be a very good competition here, bud. Although uh, Bill Keenan is an international competitor, I think this is one of his first professional competitions of the season. So we're going to see some very, very tough skiing. And a nice spread eagle by uh, Stu O'Brien here. Looks like Bill Keenan, though, is out ahead in the steeper section of the course. Now, as we mentioned before, if you finish first, doesn't necessarily you won it. Speed only counts for 20% of the mark. But coming down to the bottom, Stu O'Brien is very happy. We're waiting for the judge's decision. I think it will be close. Remember, Bill Keenan finished first. And here's a big upset. Bill Keenan is the winner. Stu O'Brien skis out, really stunned. He had a great run, but maybe that finishing second behind Bill Keenan, that 20% might have determined the winner, Peter. I think you could be right, bud. Uh, as we look here in the slow motion, uh, Stu O'Brien is skiing very well. And uh, this is a beautiful execution of a twister spread eagle maneuver with a nice solid landing. This is quite an upset end, as you say, Bill Keenan will be going on to the next round. Okay, here we go to the next round. Boy, the crowd is really stripped down here. It is a gorgeous day. This is John Zuck will be on the right-hand side. The left-hand side is Ken Gold in the red sweater. Both skiers skiing very well. And uh, John Zuck, as you see, is wearing some yellow knee pads. Now, the reason for that, bud, is to define his turns for the judges who are way down the course. If they're looking at those yellow knee pads against the uh, white snow, it helps them to see how well he's turning. For the skiers, it looks like he's having a little trouble here. And Ken Gold is skiing very well, turning well into the latter section of the course. We're waiting for the judges again. And number 33, Ken Gold, goes on to the next round. As I say, this course is extremely high. It's going to be very difficult for him to finish. And two of the top competitors on the tour are the Godstein brothers, whom I talked to earlier. We have a combination here, brothers, David and Graham Godstein, both on the Pro Mogul Tour. Graham, do you hit highs and lows in skiing? I mean, sometimes, some competitions, you might be in great shape and don't ski well. Other competitions, you might not feel well and you ski very well. Yeah, there's definitely that time where you, you think you're skiing your best and it shows. You know, you can feel it. You have your on days and your off days. And it's just different peaks. Graham, now, okay, say you're skiing against a certain opponent. You know his maybe strong points and weak points. Do you try and accentuate what you can do better than he can, so his weak point looks worse than your strong point? Yes, I usually take that into consideration. I know if, if he's not a very good turner, I'll try to put out a lot more turns, and if he's really good in the air, then I'll do my best aerial maneuvers to out it, do him in the air. So it is very important whom you ski against in the draw. Yes, that's very important. Here we are at the top once again. On the right-hand course will be uh, Graham Godstein, but we're looking at Bill Hughes, who will be on the red course. Graham has the hat on, and he's a way to do the distinguishing except in the courses, because it does get confusing with our different camera angles. It's extremely difficult to cover the sport, and I think the camera work is really superb. We're all set at the top. Graham Godstein with the cap on. Remember, he is second overall in the 1981, 80, that is, Pro Mogul Tour. Now, although it is early in these beginning 
Bill Hughes is really going to have to turn it on against his for former World Cup competitor, Graham Godstein. Graham has got an excellent racing technique, as we see him coming down the course here, turning very, very well. Uh, his body symmetry over his skis, and a uh, nice twister down there at the, at the bottom of the course. Well, he has to be careful after seeing uh, Stu O'Brien upset in the round before this. And, but he survives. The winner is Graham Godstein. Gets over or beyond Bill Hughes in this round, showing you a lot of air there. God, what a great skier. Beautiful maneuvers by Graham Godstein, and very, very nice knee work. Right over his skis, and upper body is nice and quiet and fluid. I don't know how these competitors take it. I think the knees and the, the bottom of the lower back would really suffer going through those moguls. He's absorbing very well in his knees, but you want to absorb in your knees and not in your back. Bud Palmer along with Peter Johnson. You're looking at our next pair. That is Scott Sabina, who will be in the blue course to the right. He'll be wearing red against Rob Huntoon, who'll be wearing blue. Scott Sabina has quite a few brothers who also compete on the tour. Craig and also Eric. Rob Huntoon on the left in blue is the brother of Callan Huntoon, who's one of the finest mogul skiers on the women's tour. Getting ready, trying to relax at the top. That is Scott Sabina in red. What do you do at the top there, Peter, trying to relax anyway? Well, boy, but I tell you, I, I breathe uh, very deeply at the top of the course. I try to block out any kind of uh, distraction from the outside and pretty much go into my own uh, little world there so I can uh, prepare, for the, prepare for the run. It looks as though Scott's a little nervous at the top of the course here. This is one of his first pro mogul competitions. And uh, we'll see how he does against Rob Huntoon with a nice spread eagle. And it looks as though Scott Sabina is not skiing with much finesse, but he's able to maintain, and he's doing all right now. A nice spread eagle, but a little out of control. Almost ran into the barrier. Rob Huntoon out ahead. Uh, Scott Sabina, Rob Huntoon, a little air at the end. Almost falls at the end, recovers. We'll wait for the judge's decision. The five and the winner is Rob Huntoon defeats Scott Sabina. So Rob, number six in blue, goes on to the next round. Tough course here, and the moguls are getting very soft. But Scott really most commendable on how he finished, but did not win. Rob Huntoon goes on ahead. Here's a little slow motion replay when Scott Sabat looked like he's in a bit of trouble there, Peter. As you see, but Scott dropped his arm back a little bit, and that threw his whole body back. Uh, it got him in a little bit of trouble, and I think that affected the rest of his run down in the steeper section in the most important part of the course. He's turning very well now, though. There he goes up with a spread eagle. Not a strong initiation of the jump, and therefore it affected his, his execution and the entire jump. He almost went into the fence. Okay, we go to the next round in red. Uh, will be Jim McMasters against Craig Sabina, the older brother of the gentleman we just saw who was defeated, Scott Sabina. There they go. Craig Sabina on the blue course in red. Beautiful. Uh, Jim, Ma Jim McMasters is down. Now, these two are World Cup rivals, and uh, Craig Sabina has done very well in the World Cup tour. He's turning very well here. Uh, he's, he's skiing very strong. This is one of the uh, stronger runs I've seen that Craig has made today. But why would he uh, ski less strongly after Jim has, has fallen? Well, I'm not sure, but I think Jim was, was out of uh, Craig's peripheral vision there, and I don't think that he fell. I don't think that he knew that he fell. Well, now he, I think you're right. He sort of looked around and said, where's Jim? Oh, he fell because he's still going strongly at the end. All he had to do was complete the course. Craig wanted this one in the bag, and uh, it looks like the judge's decisions have given it to Craig. Did you see here, boy? It's real important when you get air. You cannot drop your body back as, as uh, Jim did here, landed on the backside of the mogul, and it threw his skis up in front of him, and he got himself in trouble. Luckily, he didn't hurt himself. It's quite a fall. But it was a hell of a recovery. McMaster still continued. Oh, I see why. Craig kept on going because uh, Jim McMaster's kept uh, and he didn't coming miss a down. Ski. In the starting gate on the red course, wearing red is Bruce Bolesky, our cameraman stripped down, enjoying the beautiful weather here at Arapahoe Basin. He'll be facing Paul Rosenberg, who'll be in the blue course. Paul's quite young for competitors. He's eight, 19 years of age from Saratoga, California. And Bruce Bolesky is 23. Uh, is, he, is he getting a line down the course for his first couple of turns? Do you think you try and do that? Oh, you always try to pick about the first three or four moguls, at least to uh, set the pace for the rest of the run. Now, these are
are two, again, World Cup rivals, and as you say, Rosenberg is young, but he's an awfully aggressive skier. It looks like Gillespie's skiing very well. Both of them coming into the dogleg and the steeper section of the course, just about neck and neck. And like Bruce has pulled a little bit ahead, though, Rosenberg Peter. is turning well, and it, it does look like Bolesky is through the finish line first, but as you say, that's only 20% of the score. Boy, I hate to be a judge on this one. There it is. The judge has given to Bruce Bolesky. He advances. Must have been a very difficult de decision. Paul Rosenberg comes out a bit disappointed, and we go to the top once again for the next pair, which will be Chip DeFay in the blue course, which will be on the right-hand side of your screen. And in the dark sweater, his opponent is Mike Young. Mike Young is 22 years old. Hometown is Elgin, Illinois. And we're now looking at Chip DeFay. There's a long course. That angle doesn't give you any idea of how steep it is. Okay, we see you there. We're all having a heck of a good time here at Arapahoe Basin. Awful lot of pretty girls around. That's one of the great exciting things of skiing. And you can take advantage of them, too. I just knock them down on the course. That's perfectly all right. Get hit by a snowball. Why not? She's my girl, not yours. Get your own gal up here. <laughs> anyway, back at the top of the course, we have Chip DeFay in the blue sweater on the blue course against Mike Young. Boy, there's determination for you in the face of Mike Young. Mike Young and Chip DeFay. Now, Chip DeFay hails from uh, Sun Valley, Idaho, where I'm sure he's been ta taking a few lessons from uh, our tour leader, Joey Cordeaux. Here's uh, Mike Young, Chip DeFay, with a fairly good spread eagle, but got himself out of control, and it oh! looks like he's down. That's a tough break for Chip DeFay. But he's back up, so he is not disqualified from the competition. Well, I don't blame him. That was a heck of a fall. He's okay. One of the interesting things about uh, mogul skiing, the decision naturally goes to Mike Young. The falls look bad, but rarely does anybody get hurt. Now, Chip DeFay got, got forward on his skis here, was unprepared, and hit another mogul, catching an edge, which threw him down. It's lucky that he really didn't twist a leg right here. Well, they're in awfully good shape, and it's a warm day. Rather dramatic fall. I and the moguls are soft. I'm sure the crowd loved this one. Rather Chip DeFay than me, I'll tell you that. He'd be picking me up all over the course if I took a <laughs> fall like that. Looks like Chip DeFay is all right, though, and Mike Young will move on to the next round. Well, that shows what youth and conditioning can do for you. Chip DeFay is 20 years old. Makes a nice recovery, actually, from the fall. Must have his bindings really clamped down because they didn't come off. Hello there, we say. And earlier I spoke to a rookie on the tour who finished second at Aspen Highlands, David Ajax. Do you try and emulate any other person on the course? Do you try and pattern your skiing after anybody else? I mean, on the tour, rather? Mm, yes and no. It's just, uh, um, yes, because the number one person would be obviously a uh, person you should follow. I mean, he's winning, you know. I mean, Joey Cordeaux is in first place. Now, do we try and pattern your skiing after his? In the steeps, yes. Flats, no. Why not? Why not in the flats? Because uh, the turn, you got to have an acceleration turn. You got to make your turn accelerate rather than uh, hold back. I feel Joe holds back too much in the flats. He should let him run. But that's all technique. It's uh, difficult to do. Gee, you have a lot of confidence. You might do pretty well. I hope to. We'll see. And that is David Ajax will be on the blue course. He is in blue. He'll be facing Don St. Pierre who will be on the red course. Very interesting matchup here. David Ajax, as we said, surprised everybody by finishing second at Aspen Highlands. And Donnie St. Pierre, though, but is a tough contender. He comes from Winter Park, Colorado, which right, is right over the hills here, and I'm sure that he's been here earlier on in the week practicing on this course. So uh, time will tell. Looks like they're about ready to go here. Don St. Pierre once again in blue. It'll be David Ajax in black. There's David right there. And off. Those skiers skiing very well at the top of the course. David Ajax has a remarkable ability to stay right over his skis. Good angulation. Very, very good knee action by David Ajax. He looks awfully good. Our cameras are following him, but Don St. Pierre on the other course is doing equally as well on the red course. I give David Ajax.
Jacks a couple of years, and he could be a very strong com contender in these uh, World Cup and professional competitions. He's slowing down. We're waiting for the judge. Another upset. It goes to Don St. Pierre. There he is, very surprising. Number 66, defeating David Ajax, who surprised everybody, the rookie, by finishing second at Aspen Highlands. And this gives you some idea of the view here at Arapahoe Basin. It is a basin right in the heart of the Colorado Rockies. It really is a superb place to ski. Big upset there with Don St. Pierre advancing. And earlier I spoke to one of the favorites here, David Godstein. Well, David, here you are in, in second place to Joey. Uh, a chance of catching him tomorrow. Is this going to affect your skiing at all? Uh, I think it's going to inspire me to ski my best. Whether I, whether he gets first or second overall, I'm out to win the competition. I take each one at, at a single rate. If I don't win the car, or if I do, I still could use the prize money, and I'm going to ski my best to win. Well, since you were raised on rather steep conditions, this might be a course compatible to your type of skiing. It's very steep. Do you like that type of course? Yeah, I like a steep course. We're used to the very steep terrain and we've always skied where we're controlling our ski and controlling our speed, so it's this is our kind of hill. It's also a very long course. I think we'll do real well tomorrow. Well, Graham, it's interesting. Here you are sitting in third place. Your brother is second. Do you think you can catch your brother tomorrow? Uh, I don't know. I think it, it could be that way could possibly happen. I hope that he wins so that, you know, he has a chance at the car myself. Will it bother you at all trying to overtake your brother or not? No, well, we tied for second last year overall on the tour, and he was trying to catch me, and he won the final competition. So I was going into the finals ahead last year, and this year he's going into the finals ahead, and I'm trying to catch him. What do you think about just before you go down the course? Well, there's so many runs that we make. A lot of times we think about the first air that we're going to get. We ski so many runs that our turns pretty much come natural nowadays. So we usually think about who our, compo who our opponent is and how hard we're going to have to ski to beat each opponent and advance into the next round. And we take that into big consideration. God's team brothers, not only great competitors, but two great guys at the same time, train all year round for their sport. And uh, David Godstein is now up there. He is in the yellow sweater on the blue course, facing Eric Sabina, one of the three Sabina boys on the tour. That's Eric on the left-hand side in the red course. Now, Eric Sabina is uh, a competitor in these pro mogul competitions. He's the middle brother of the Sabina trio, as you mentioned. And uh, think about that he's in here just for the fun of it. He's in here with his other two brothers, and we'll see how he fares against this season veteran David Godstein. That's David in the yellow sweater. Good air. David Scott Godstein, as usual, is turning very, very well. He's also got a good, strong racing technique, as does his brother Graham. A little air there by David. He's out ahead of Eric Sabina. There's Eric. We're concentrating on David Godstein, who's certainly one of the favorites here. Finishes out ahead. So David Godstein advances here at Arapahoe Basin. Here is David Godstein once again in slow motion, really showing you a superb technique, I think, Peter. Let's take a look at this jump here. Nice jump, spread eagle, very comfortable over his ski. He's got a little bit back there, but that's not uncommon on a steep course like this. Great recovery, too. Another shot. Very nice back scratcher by David Godstein. Very comfortable over his skis. I don't see how you know where you're coming down. I mean, I would think you'd get up in the air and, oops, if you don't come down in some pre-selected place, you could really be off balance. It's an interesting situation, as you've seen by uh, a number of these competitors who have lost it by not anticipating where they're going to land. On, on a steep course like this, I think it'd be extremely difficult trying to anticipate the landing. Well, it takes time to learn anything like this. It sure does. And David Godstein finishes a beautiful run. He advances, as we mentioned. Bud Palmer along with Peter Johnson. And earlier I talked with Joey Cordell. Do you feel any pressure? I mean, here's the final one. You're in the lead. I mean, you have a very good chance of not only collecting some more money, but also getting that beautiful Turbo Sab automobile. And is that on your mind at all? Oh, yeah. It's been on my mind ever since the first one. It's... 
the biggest thing that's probably happened to me ever. Would you ski more cautiously because of this or not? Um, not up till now. Maybe, maybe tomorrow, but I doubt it. I'm going to go for good turns tomorrow. Well, good luck to you, Joey. If you have a good run tomorrow, you'll be the proud possessor of a beautiful Turbo Saab, and you can go back to catch him in style. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> At the top is Joey Cordo. On the red course, he has the yellow pants on. He'll be facing at Dan Curdy. There's Joey, very determined, and they're off. Joey had a little slip of his pole, but that certainly didn't affect the top part of his run. Looks as though Joey has warmed up quite a bit since the first round. Skiing very well down here and then coming into the dog leg and into the steeper section. Dan Curdy looks like he's a little bit out of control, but he happens to maintain. Boy, Dan Curdy really recovered then the hang on. Yeah, and it looks as though uh, Joey Cordo got into a little rough water, but was able to maintain composure right into the final seconds of his run. That's a run by Joey Cordo, agreed to by the judges. Joey Cordo advances, and here he is in slow motion along with Dan Curdy. This is a beautiful shot of both competitors, neck and neck, coming down into the steeper section of the course. And it's incredible how steep this course is. That's one thing that cameras can never make you realize is how steep this is. It'd be very difficult to crawl up this course on your hands and knees. That's how steep it is. It doesn't look like it, but boy, it is incredible. Well, you can see here how it just drops off from that flag. It goes down to about 60 degrees. That shows you a little bit how steep it is with the turbo sab in the background there. And Joey Cordo, as we said, advances once again. Certainly a favorite here to win that car and also win the all-around championship on the Pro Mogul Tour. And early I had an opportunity to talk to one of the tour veterans, 32-year-old Paco Ward. This is Paco Ward, who people consider the veteran on the tour. He's 32 years old, and he has a very interesting pair of ski boots he skis on, as you can see. And, uh, real, com real comfortable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Natural boot, right? Yes. Paco, how do you feel when people come up and call you the old man of the tour at 32? At my age, I think 32 is extremely young. Well, I don't feel it's old at all. I get a kick out of it. You know, if they're going to call me the old man and think that they should be out there beating me all the time. Uh, they got another thing coming because 32 is an old. Now you came back this year to start competing again. Why? Well, for the thrill of it all. I really enjoy the competition. I enjoy getting pumped up and putting it on the line and seeing what happens. Now you've been in freestyle for how many years now? I'll be about five now since 76. Uh huh. Do you still get as much of a bang out of it as you did initially or not? Oh yeah, every bit. Do Probably uh, more, probably more. Really? Do the uh, young skiers come to you for advice? I mean, are you the father image on the tour? No, I don't. No, they don't look for much advice, but they do seem to have the father image. You know, they give me a little grief. <laughs> Does that bother you? <laughs> no. You seem to have a sense of humor about it. Oh yeah, you got to keep your sense of humor. <laughs> How has the sport changed since you've been in it? Um. Well, that's a tough one. Uh, Okay, let's talk about, is the level of competition better now than it was? Okay, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Uh, I think that the depth is real good right now in the Pro Mobile Tour. In fact, the depth, there's 20, 25 guys that could win it, I think. Um, maybe in 76, there w the depth wasn't as, weren't as many good skiers. Mm -hmm. And then also, well, the technique has changed a lot with longer skis. So more carved turns, less quick turns. That In that respect, it's changed. In other words, in, in 76, you could wear any, any length ski you wanted to, couldn't you? Right, and as a matter of fact, I was skiing on a much shorter ski, skiing totally different style. I think the trend right now is much better for the sport. Would you feel that now with a longer ski, it, it's the better skier who has a better chance of winning? Oh, definitely. The person who uses a long ski the way it's meant to be used, and uh, you can tackle any slope with a long ski and make it work. That's the guy that's going to win. After all this competition, five or six years of competition, what does your body have to say about it this year at 32? The body says keep on going. <laughs> How about mentally, the same thing? Oh, yeah. Keep plugging away as long as it's fun. If it all of a sudden becomes uh, unenjoyable, I won't be around, but it's very enjoyable. Great interview with Paco Ward is a great reflection of the competitors on the tour, both men and women. They're very attractive, interesting, intelligent people. And there's Paco Ward in dark against Charlie Webster with a red sweater on. Paco Ward's going to have to ski really well. Charlie Webster had a good first.
first round, and it looks like Paco dropped his shoulder back. Now, that's interrupting his center of balance there for a second. We'll reflect uh, in the judge's eyes on his run. Coming into the steep section now, Paco Ward just a little bit ahead of, Char of uh, Charlie Webster. And once again, if you finish first, it's only 20% of the mark. They're down at the bottom. And the judges say it is Charlie Webster. Maybe an upset because the veteran Paco Ward finished fourth at our last competition at Aspen Highlands. And one of the marks up again, says one of the officials, so the five judges raise the marks, and once again, as we said before, Charlie Webster is the winner. Maybe somebody thought that Paco Ward had won. At one, that is. Rather large crowd here. It's a gorgeous day. On to the next round. It'll be Ken Gold against Bill Campbell. That's Bill Campbell, number four on the blue course, studying what he has ahead of him against Ken Gold, number 33. Bill Campbell is 24 years of age, lives in Sun Valley, Idaho, and his competitor here, Ken Gold, also studying the course, is a building contractor. Look where those skis have to drop off. He's got some idea how steep it is. It gets steeper after this. There they go. And Ken Gold is an awfully good skier. This gives you a good idea of the small flags that, de that uh, determine each skier's course. Uh, if one of the skiers happens to ski into the other person's course, they're automatically disqualified. Ken Gold going at down there. And, ooh, bad break for Bill Campbell. He's Ken Gold right. can take his time now as he finishes up the last section of the course. And Ken Gold will advance to the next round. A tough break for Bill Campbell, doing pretty well till he had that ball. Here he comes, they're both okay. Congratulations. These people are real sportsmen. Let's take a look at that fall of Bill Campbell's. Now, as you can see here, Bud, uh, Bill Campbell just got a little too far forward on his skis. Now, that's what happens when it's warm out, uh, the bumps get soft, and it's you really have to ski aggressively to drive through these soft moguls, and it uh, looks as though Bill just couldn't, couldn't handle it, and uh, this was the result. Good tough recovery, break for, Good recovery, but uh, it's a tough break. It's too bad he's not going to move on, and Ken Gold has skied very well. Although he was in trouble at the top, he's, he's able to go on to the next round. Well, it's a good break for Bill Campbell because he didn't break any. <laughs> oh, are we having a good time here at Arapahoe Basin, and this is at 12,000 feet. Really neat to watch the Pro Mogul Tour because most of the courses are so steep you have a totally unimpaired view of what's going on. And at the top is Mark Shea getting ready for the next run. And a few weeks ago at Aspen Highlands, Mark Shea took one kind of a spectacular fall. It comes up right after he goes up into the air, which is going to occur right now. Now watch what happens. After the competition, I had a chance to talk to Mark Shea about that fall. And what happened, Mark? Well, when I went up and took air, uh, I landed, and next thing I knew, I was tumbling. I thought uh, immediately that, uh, uh, that I'd hit something in the course or had a pre-release or something. And after looking at the videos, uh, I'm real lucky that I came out. My knee was really tweaked out, and uh, it was a good thing that I released. I was a little mad about it at the time, but I'm always mad when I, when I fall and crash. Don't you think one of the great advancements in skiing is the safety of the equipment? Like, uh, well, like as you just said, you released out of your bindings. Well, I know that uh, uh, in any competition, you're always skiing at, uh, at full speed, and you, you never want your, your equipment to fail on you. And a lot of times, uh, in the competitor's mind, you figure you should never fall. Uh, equipment should never come off because you have confidence in your own ability uh, that you should never have any troubles. In this particular instance, uh, when I when I crashed, uh, uh, I had questions in my own mind. After I've seen the video, uh, I think that I'm real lucky that I, I did release on this particular fall. I don't think if you hadn't released out of your binding, I wouldn't be talking to you here today. I think that you'd be talking with me with a little plaster cast on my left leg. And there'd be white sheets all over exactly. you and nurses <laughs> about. Well, that wouldn't be all that bad. But <laughs> I'd rather have you the way you are. <laughs> Thanks. And here he is at the top. On the blue course, and the right-hand course is Mark Shea. And ironic enough, in that fall at Aspen Highlands, it occurred against Graham Gottstein. And who is he racing against today? That's right, Graham Gottstein. These are old rivals, should be white.
a race. But in every sport, there's a certain amount of uh, psychological strategy that goes on. It looks as though Graham uh, is assuming the mad dog role here, just to probably psych out Mark for this run. I don't think you can psych Mark. Got Steen off to a fairly good start. Both neck and neck here. Godstein is skiing very aggressively at, into the dog leg and down the steeper section, but then so, so is Mark Shea. Mark Shea knows he has to do some very good turning here to beat Graham Godstein. Ooh. Godstein is across first. It was very close. Remember, that does not determine it. Both think they've won. You finish first does not mean that's only 20% of it, and Graham says, yes, I've got it. Mark Shea, bitterly disappointed, very difficult for the judges. It was very, very close. Both competitors skied absolutely beautifully, and I probably think that Graham Godstein, that 20% for finishing first, might have won it for him. Well, I don't know, bud. He did, he did make it through first, but it looked as though uh, Mark did have a couple of technical difficulties up there in the steeper sections of the course. Boy, yeah. fabulous there then by Graham. Graham Godstein has a remarkable, uh, mar remarkable ability to maintain his composure right over his skis. Okay, at the top we go to the next round. This is Rob Huntoon against Mike Young. Mike Young is in the red course. We look over at Rob Huntoon. That's very nice. His blue matches the blue of the flags. Makes it very easy for all of us. You can hear the starter then. Both aggressive skiers here, and you can see that the little uh, definition face going right down the center of the course. Robbie Huntoon having a little trouble at the top. Skiing very well. Knees together, good absorption. And it looks as though Mike Young is not skiing that aggressively. That's going to cost him, oh, but he a does throw a helicopter. Lands it. And that was a beautiful execution of a helicopter. Let's see what the judges think. Rob Huntoon finished first. And it goes to Rob Huntoon. Good run by both competitors. It's getting extremely close. Mike Young goes down to defeat. Rob Huntoon will continue. Very interested spectator. Hello there. A lot of pretty girls around skiing. I think one of the great attractions of it. That's why you have so many good-looking men competitors and female at the same time. We'll see the girls coming up pretty soon. At the top, they're off. It's Don St. Pierre against Craig Sabina. Sabina in the red course with the red sweater. Don St. Pierre is going to really have to turn it on here for Sabina. Sabina, of course, a World Cup competitor and uh, down here skiing on the Pro Mobile Tour. He's turning fairly well, but he's not going that fast, bud. And this is a steeper section of the course. It looks as though he may be a little fatigued. He's having a little trouble there, and that's uh, that's unusual for a top-notch skier. He comes through, but despite the troubles, Don St. Pierre, we didn't get much of a view of Don, is having more trouble, so Craig Sabina, number seven, is the winner. Craig Sabina turning very well through this section with a nice spread eagle and a perfectly executed landing. He gets a little bit back on his skis right here, and that uh, leads to a little trouble. But Craig Sabina happy to go on to the next round. Once again, you can see the relaxation fun about skiing here. This is a natural basin high on the Colorado Rockies at 12,000 feet, a perfect place to hold a skiing competition. This gives you some idea of our course. It's the steepest on the tour, not the longest, but certainly the steepest. The next pair features David Godstein, and he cannot lose this next race and win the Grand Prix Championship. There is David. His opponent you saw in red is Bruce Bolesky. David Godstein, the mention, must win this race to win the Grand Prix Championship. Is he picking his line there looking down the course, Peter? Well, yes, I think a better... Uh a better example of that was just um, Bruce Bileski, Bileski had his hands out. He was pointing down to probably about the top three or four bumps. Now what a skier will do is choose the top three or four bumps just to set the pace for the rest of the run. This is going to be a close one. Of course, uh, Bileski's been around for a long time. He's uh, been here since the inception of freestyle years ago. It'll be a very tight race, but boy, Godstein looks terrific. Godstein is pouring it on right here. He knows he has to ski well because Bileski is a tough competitor. Bileski is skiing equally well. Nice air then by Godstein. A little ahead down here in the last section. But again, he's, even though he is first person through the course, that does not necessarily mean he will win the event. There's the finish. And David thinks he's won. We'll wait for the judge's decision. 
would you say it? 60 40? Uh, 70 30? At this point, it's how psyched can you get? It's probably 80 20. You know, if you're psyched to ski, you'll ski good. If you're not psyched, you know, you'll just you'll just come down with like another day. Yeah, it's 80% mental, right? Right. Do you have any thought in your mind just before you just before you take off? I mean, here's your opponent beside you. What, what do you try and concentrate on? Um, where am I going to ski on the moguls? Like, I try not to jump into the into the valleys. I try to stay on the back sides. Now this is a fairly steep course. Can you determine pretty much looking down at where you'd like to turn all the way to the finish or not? Um, on my way down, yeah. I try to direct, you know, I'm trying to be where I want to be at every moment. Now at this point, Joey Cordeaux has won the championship. There he is. He's also won the Turbo Sab. But being the competitor he is, he really wants to win the whole darn thing. He wants to win this championship too. He's up against Charlie Webster. And he's sure going to give uh, Charlie Webster a run for his money. Beautiful spread eagle there. And Joey Cordeaux has to be one of the uh, most respected of all American skiers in the freestyle circuits. Uh, and certainly the favorite here among the Pro Mogul Tour fans. Turning very well, the crowds are loving it. And a nice twister coming into the last section. Here's our champion, still going after it. He's won on points, but he wants to win this too. And he does, he defeats Charlie Webster to continue on to the quest to winning this championship. Great competitor, Joey Cordell, the boys are getting to feel the altitude, and I really don't blame him, because as I mentioned before, it's 12,000 feet, he's really gasping for breath, and it's pretty tough coming down there, making a, a couple of thousand turns in this short course. Here is Joey Cordell again showing his championship style. Oh boy, to ski like that. Great spread, Eagle. This is really a pleasure to watch, but he really knows how to absorb the bumps and use his knees to the best of their uh, ability. Or very, all very all fine all skier. Extension the compression <laughs> that your knees can take. And there's his car at the bottom. He makes it look so easy. That's what I like about it. He's so smooth and so liquid. That's the whole idea about behind doing this. As long as it's easy and as long as it's fun. And Joey Cordo sure knows how to do it. <laughs> He's a great champion. I think Barbara probably already has a champagne bottle corked down at the bottom there. Very nice run by Joey. There's our champion. He's the number Cordo. one bib. And the gentleman on the right-hand side of that group is Stan Helling, who is the vice president of Saab, enjoying the competition and climbing to the top. It's another one of our competitors, Bill Keenan, number 48. Bill was second overall in the 1980 World Cup Mogul Championship. And by the way, he's the only Canadian to take a first in the European Mogul Meets. He'll be facing Ken Gold, and they're off. That is Bill Keenan in yellow against Ken Gold with a red sweater on the left-hand side of the beer screen right now. This is going to be a tough meet for uh, Ken Gold because Keenan, now uh, hailing from Calgary, Alberta, uh, skis these, these steep terrains, and of course this, this terrain is steep and you can ski it with familiarity. Ken Looks Gold is having some problems. He is having a little bit of trouble over there, and nice spread eagle by Bill Keenan at the bottom. Bill also finishes first, and uh, the judges say it is Bill Keenan. Watch Bill once again in slow motion. Truly is incredible how they can select a line. These moguls are enormous. And they get steeper and bigger down in the second part of this course. Nice spread, Eagle. Perfectly executed. Bill Keenan is going to make a, maybe become a finalist against Joey Cordell. We'll have to wait and see, but he's skiing awfully well in this competition. And that would be a remarkable event. Earlier I had a chance to talk to two of the top competitors on the Pro Mogul Tour, the brothers Gottstein. Does it help being brothers? I ask you first. I mean, David, is, do, you, do you critique your brother, criticize yours? Does he help you back and forth or what? Well, we don't critique.
critique each other a lot. We just ski together a lot. We like each other's technique and we get along really well. We've skied together for 20 years, so it's just a natural for us to ski together. And it, when one does good, the other one gets a thrill out of it and it helps them win the next round. All right, say you ski before your brother, you come down the course. Do you have any communication if Graham's still at the top to help him? This happened with Steve and Phil Mayer, remember? When uh, Steve skied first in the, in the World Cup and told Phil where an icy spot was, Phil came down and Ingemar Stenmark didn't have the same information and slipped a couple of times. Do you help each other this way? Oh, all the time. All the time we do that. We help each other as much as we can. And even before the competition, we'll tell each other where we think we should do a certain maneuver or where not to. What about mentally? Do you, do you boost each other up? Well, sometimes if I see that Graham's getting a little weak, I'll get him all mad and ex I'll get him ticked off and that'll help him to come on and ski good. That worked at, at Steamboat because at the last contest at Steamboat, we, he was, I knew he could win and he had won last year, but his attitude hadn't been that good up till then and I just got him all mad and I started saying a few things that got him mad and he definitely <laughs> skied better that day. Boy, Graham, he's talking about you. What about your brother? How do you get him stoked up? Oh, well, we just, you know, it works both ways, you know. If we can get each other riled, we ski better. Sometimes, you know, I'll just tell him, you got to start skiing harder. Don't hold back, and that'll help him. Well, in other words, we see the guys team brothers at the top arguing vehemently. They're not really arguing, just getting each other stoked up. Is that it? Yeah, that, that sometimes <laughs> is it. Uh-huh. There is great affection between those two brothers and Graham Gossip are facing this man, Rob Huntoon. And Graham would dearly love to win this competition since his brother David has been beaten. They don't like to be beaten. They like to have a Godstein on top. We'll see what happens here. That will be uh, Graham Godstein with the cap on. There he is facing Rob Huntoon in blue. Bye. 
catch that ball, and what happened, Peter? Well, it looks like uh, Craig Zapina was just a little fatigued here. He's bending at the waist, as you can see, not absorbing in his knees, and he just dropped his arm, but arms back. Didn't have the, the aggressiveness to pull through. And Bruce Bolesky keeps on going. On to the next round. Very nice skiing by Bruce Bolesky. Everybody is skiing well. Do you think the warm weather is a contributing factor or not? The warm weather and also it's such a good course. Very demanding course for this for this group of talented skiers. Extremely well maintained too. Mm -hmm. But Parma along with Peter Johnson, we're down to the semifinals of our final stop on the World Pro Mogul Tour. We have Bill Keenan versus Joey Cordell. Joey Cordell, as we mentioned, has won the Saab Turbo. It's Bruce Bolesky versus Graham Godstein in our semifinals. And finally, Ken Gold against Chip Buffet for fifth and sixth. And if they, anybody can stop Joey Cordell now as far as winning this competition. Uh, it's not likely, but I think Graham Godstein would certainly like to get some revenge back uh, for his brother David, who unfortunately fell earlier on this afternoon. It'll be close, but I think Joey's pretty much got it in the bag. Yeah, but Joey Cordell is skiing so on the steep course, as you said, it'd be awfully hard to beat. And earlier I had a chance to talk to Joey Cordell. Joey, what about this course here at, at, uh, at Arapahoe? A lot of it to your liking, isn't it? Oh, very much. I love it. I mean, you, you're either in control or you're not. Is this the steepest course you've seen on the tour? Um, yeah, this is the steepest one of the year. And there is Joey Cordo, who will have the yellow pants on with a black top against Bill Keenan, who's all in yellow. As he mentioned, this is the semifinals. Joey Cordo is the overall winner. He's won the car, but he'd like to win this championship, really finish off like a champion. Even so, this is going to be a very tough matchup of, against two of North America's finest competitors, of course, Joey Cordo from America and Bill Keenan from Canada. Very nice spread eagle by Joey Cordo. The light is really getting flat. Stay near the last and steepest section of this course. And Joey Cordo comes across the finish line, as does Bill Keenan. It's gonna be extremely coarse. Both boys scored beautifully all the way around. And Joey Cordo realizes he has one, <laughs> claps his hands, so he goes on to the finals. Here's a little slow motion of Joey Cordo coming down the course. Absolutely beautiful body symmetry in the way Joey Cordo skis these moguls. Seems to have perfect balance all the time, Peter, right over his skis in the park. Right position. over his skis, and you've seen that this course has is, is really thrashed a lot of competitors around who aren't that familiar with body symmetry and being able to, to keep their body straight over their skis. He gets a little bit back there, but is able to pull, pull right over them again. Very nice skiing. As you mentioned, the light is becoming extremely difficult. When it gets overcast, it really flattens out the whole course. And trying to determine, especially when you get air where you're going to land, must be very difficult. But as these mobile skiers know, you're, you must be able to compete in any, in, under any condition. So Joey Cordell goes on to the finals. Now, earlier this week, I talked to the Godstein brothers about their mental attitude. What do you think about, how, how, do, you, how do you relax at the top of the hill? Uh, I do a lot of breathing exercises where I'll breathe deep into my stomach and relax myself just before the run and then try to stay as relaxed as I can so I build up the attention. I'll just build it up until right at the last minute when you break out of the starting gate then you want full energy and that's when you, that's when you let it all out. I think if I start deep breathing at the top and look at that course, I'd probably hyperventilate and pass out. I think it's a... <laughs> Well, at that altitude, it'd be hard to hyperventilate because there's not enough oxygen up there. <laughs> Does so. a danger element ever come into you, into it, as far as you're concerned, Dave? Danger is a big factor in this sport. One fall could end a career, so everything you do is, you don't want to go too far, but you want to go right to the, to the edge and ski at that ability. How about you, Graham? You, you conscious of what might happen or not? Yes, I'm always conscious of the danger element. That's a very important part, and you have to take the weather conditions and the snow conditions and the whole hill into consideration and then decide what you're going to do and how far you're going to take it. Oh, I think you're saying this right now, but I bet when you get on top you just go for it, but you don't even think about it. <laughs> yeah. Huh? I don't right? know. No, it's really, you have to think about it because we've been doing it a long time, you know, and it's, there's definitely a danger factor there. Have either of you ever suffered a serious injury in, in mogul skiing? Mm -hmm. Lots of cuts and bruises. 
a lot of close calls and a lot of bruises, but we've been fairly lucky and survived a long career. Is that because you think you're you're in good shape and your mental attitude is positive? Right. Oh, that's definitely an important part of it. Well, that's one of the beauties about the Pro Mobile Tour. There are very few serious injuries on the mobile course. Now, the winner here will face Joey Cordeaux in the finals. That is Graham Godstein, number three, against Bruce Bolesky. Godstein is on the red course, and they're off. Two World Cup veterans. Graham Godstein having competed in the World Cup several years ago, and Bruce Bolesky, a current World Cup competitor. Boy, Graham looks good. And so Bruce does Bruce Bolesky. Bolesky's looking awfully good, too. And Great last run. section of the course, it looks like Graham Godstein will have the speed score, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he will win. Very close at the finish. It Great is run close. by both competitors. Let's see who the winner is, who will go into the finals. It's Graham Godstein on the red course, goes into the finals against Joey Cordell. Hooray, says Graham, I don't blame him. It's a real tough race against Bruce Bolesky. Both skied extremely well. In fact, so good, here is uh, Graham Godstein again in slow motion. He's in a great position, too. Beautiful position for that jump. Balance is so good, like Joey Cordeaux. I think he's feeling comfortable. This is probably the best that I've seen Graham ski uh, consistently throughout the day, anyway. Once again, the uh, overall view of the course, you can see the chairlift in the background. Pretty good crowd down below. And now we go to the next race between Chip DeFay and Ken Gold, which will decide fifth and sixth place. That's in the double elimination format they have on the Pro Mobile Tour. Chip DeFay took that bad fall earlier, but still has a chance to finish either fifth or sixth. That is Ken Gold on the blue course with a red sweater on, Chip DeFay in gray. Now, Ken Gold is in an advantage here with his flat light. You see, he's wearing his knee pads uh, in the hopes of winning the judge's attention towards his knees. As the, judge can, as the judge, judges can see in this flat light, while wearing knee pads, they can see that he's turning a little better. But it looks oh, like he's in trouble. trouble. That he is. And, and Chip DeFay. Yep. He'll be the winner. And here is a very discouraged Ken Gold, gave it a heck of an effort, but once again we said that the light is getting rather flat, and that really is very difficult to see through these heavy moguls. So Chip DeFay takes fifth. And here is the race for third and fourth place between Bill Keenan and Bruce Bolesky. That is Bill Keenan in yellow. We're looking at Bruce Bolesky in the very jazzy red outfit. to fall. 